Um, we're going to learn more about that today. And we have Rebecca Troutman, who's the natural area areas biologist at Holden Forests and Gardens. And um, with that, let me get out of this. All right. And and me... You can go ahead. All righty, let me get my PowerPoint up, oopsie. All right. Can you all see this screen okay? Looks good. Okay, all righty. So yeah, thank you all for having me today. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I, I was so excited when I learned how many people have signed up for this webinar. So thank you for coming. This is probably one of the biggest, biggest audiences that I have given a presentation for. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And like I said, feel free to put uh, questions you may have in the Q&A box. And then if you have, I have a couple questions for you all that you can just put your answers, quick answers in the chat for that. All right, so a quick agenda of what I'm hoping to cover today. I'll go through the background of how we found this aphid and uh, the process of, that we went through to identify the aphid. And then we'll get into how to identify this aphid. Um, we'll talk about some results of some pilot studies that we've been doing at Holden to kind of get at that question, like Kathy mentioned, like, is it going to affect the plant? Does it affect other plants? Um, we'll talk about the distribution of the aphids so far and then how you can report the aphids. So we've had a big citizen science push on this, which has really been helpful for us to kind of figure out where this aphid is found already. Um, and then we'll get into how, how to report it and I'll go through the EDMAPS website and there's also a few other citizen science websites we'll talk about. And then we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, my guess is that this presentation will take maybe an hour or a little bit over an hour, and then we should have hopefully plenty of time for questions. So feel free to pop them in the Q&A as I go. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, like Kathy said, my name is Becca Troutman. I'm the natural areas biologist at Holden Forest and Gardens. So I put up these pictures, not because I am a narcissist, but because I wanted to remind myself to say, okay, Yes, most people, when they see me, I look like a professional presenter, like on this picture on the right, but usually I'm out in the field. I am more of a field biologist. I do a lot of invasive species management. I do um, a lot of monitoring. So we have a, a lot of hemlock monitoring we do at Holden at the Arboretum. So I just kind of wanted to start off saying what I am, but also what I'm not. So I'm not an entomologist. I did not come into this anticipating that I would be looking at bugs all the time. So this is kind of a project that, that you know, was a, a unique opportunity for me. Um, I'm also not necessarily a researcher. I do have a, a bachelor's in biology and a master's in biology, but I do not spend my time doing statistics and a lot of detail-oriented present, uh, a lot of detail-oriented research. So the nice thing about Holden though, is we have departments that can help me with that. But what I am is very good at observation skills. And this has been really helpful for me in this project because the reason this came about was just observing what I was doing, uh, playing close attention, paying close attention to the forest and my surroundings. So that's just kind of a little bit about me and some caveats of, and you'll see why I mention this as I go through the presentation of, I'm not necessarily an entomologist. I'm not necessarily a researcher. Um, I'm a biologist, I do uh, field work and, and uh, lots of observation. So that's kind of where, we're, where I am and where I'm starting at. I just wanted to take a couple seconds to ask you all some questions. So you can just pop this in the chat. Um, a lot of you already said this, what, but I'm curious what county or state you're from. If you already put that in there, you don't have to put it in there again. So since I saw a lot of those answers, I'll go ahead and skip to the next uh, question for you all. But I'm kind of first curious, are you familiar with garlic mustard? I just a yes or no. I have a hunch that probably a lot of you are, but it's okay if you're not. I'm going to pull up the chat real quick just to monitor a little bit as well. Oh, yes, I see lots of yeses, lots of too familiar. Um, you're very familiar with garlic mustard and UGG. So, yeah, some people have limited knowledge, it looks like, but most people have are, are fairly familiar with garlic mustard. So, we'll talk about. I'll point out uh, pictures of garlic mustard and what it looks like and a little bit about it, but it seems like a lot of you are pretty familiar. 
All right, the next question I have is, have you heard of the garlic mustard aphid? A yes, no, or a sort of? Let's see, see some no's, some yeses, a negative, yep. Okay, a barely. All right, not until I saw this ad for the webinar. Some people said they have observed it before. Cool. Some people have said they've seen it a lot in their county. Cool. Very cool. So it looks like about half and half maybe so far have at least heard of the aphid. So that's good. So some of this will be new information. So like I said, feel free to ask questions as I'm going. And my last question, I'm just curious, what is your occupation or your interest in this presentation? Are you maybe a, a volunteer or just an interested, interested in nature? Um, maybe you're a land manager or you spend a lot of time pulling garlic mustard. Extension professional, a naturalist, master gardener, volunteers, nature lover, forester. Cool. Five acres of their own land, landowner managing their own woods. Great, cool. Yeah, awesome. So this is the type of people I would probably expect to be here. It's people who are interested in nature, and um, that's how I how I am too. Um, all right, I think that's all the questions that I had for you guys. So thank you for answering those. I appreciate that. All right, so I wanted to go a little bit into Holden Forest and Gardens. Oh, I guess one more question. Have any of you heard of Holden Forest and Gardens? I guess that's a good good place to start too. Some no's, a lot of yeses. Okay, some people have been there. Okay, perfect. Some grew up near here. All right, awesome. So for those of you who haven't been or haven't heard of Holden Forest and Gardens, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of where I am located and where my organization is located. So Holden Forest and Gardens is a nonprofit. Um, we're an arboretum and a botanical garden. So some people call us a zoo for plants or a living museum. So those are kind of the ideas that people think of when they think of arboretums and botanic gardens in general. We at Holden Forest and Gardens, we're in Northeast Ohio. So we have three campuses. We have the Cleveland Botanical Garden, which is in downtown Cleveland. That's about 10 acres and they have some cool uh, glass houses. And then we have the Holden Arboretum, which is where I'm centered at. And there we have about 3,500 acres. Oops, I'm gonna move this out of my way. We have about 3,500 acres and I'll show you a little bit more of what that looks like. And then we have the Leach Research Station, which is in Madison, Ohio. And that's, a, uh, I think about 20 acres. And they do a lot of rhododendron research on uh, in at that location. So moving into the Holden Arboretum a little bit more, they have some really cool kind of more touristy things to do. So on the left, they have a, an emergent tower that takes you way up above the canopy. If you get all the way to the top, you can see all the way to the lake from where we are. Uh, this middle picture is a picture of the canopy walk they do. So it's this kind of suspended bridge that goes over a river valley. So you're kind of right in the canopy at canopy level of the trees. So you can see the leaves really well and the bark really well. And then of course we have uh, this picture on the right. That's just a, a quick map view of some of the trails we have. So we have walking trails. And then of course, being an arboretum, we have a lot of collections of trees and plants, a lot of really nice manicured gardens. But we also are more than just a manicured garden. So of course, uh, this is just kind of a screenshot to show what kind of departments we have. So of course we have the things that all arboretums will have, guest services, we have horticulturists and gardeners, but we also have a research department, which is kind of unique for some arboretums. And then we have a conservation department and a community forestry department. So our community forestry department focuses more on um, teaching landowners. So the program that Kathy had mentioned before, that'll be at Holden Arboretum in our working woods. So educating landowners and the public about um, best management practices. And then, like I said, we have a research department, which is really important for me for this project. So now I'm showing you a picture of what the acreage breakdown is at the Arboretum. And really, I know this is a lot to look at, but really what I wanna get across is we have these 3,500 acres. So that's pretty big for an Arboretum. So we have what we call the core. So 
that's kind of this center area here. You can see the lake in the middle. These are kind of more where our focused collections and core gardens are. But we also have these four natural areas around us that accounts for about 3,000 of the acres that we have. We also do have in these purple uh, areas some conservation easements as well, but primarily we are, I work in the natural area. So these four large areas are where I work. So we have a lot of really interesting habitat at Holden. We have you know, our little mountain area up here that has some hemlock hardwood forest, some upland hemlock hardwood forest, which is pretty unique. Uh, in this large area here, we have some old growth beech maple forest. We have some really nice streams that go through and creeks that go through our property. So it really does have some nice natural areas, which is, like I said, where I get to work. So we have about three full-time staff that are working on our 3,000 acres of natural areas. So of course, we can't do all things all the time, but we try to do the best that we can. And these are just some pictures from our natural areas. Um, we have on the bottom left, that's a picture of just a large rock in our Stebbins Gulch natural area. Um, the bottom right, that's our little mountain, the hemlock area I was talking about in winter. So we have a lot of really unique, rare habitats. And then like, we have a fen. Uh, we also have some rare plant species as well. So a lot of work we're trying to do to protect our, our natural areas. And a lot of that work includes We'll see if you guys can see the invasive plant in this picture. I bet you have a good guess, even if you can't see it. But what do you think the plant, the invasive plant is that, that I'm showing in this picture? Any guesses? Celandine, that's a good guess. So this does kind of look like celandine. But it's just, yep, garlic mustard, I see someone. So we're looking at these small. So when it has the small rosettes, it does kind of look like celandine, but we're looking at first year small rosettes of garlic mustard. So of course, being a land manager and trying to conserve our natural areas, you can see this is a pretty diverse area, a lot of spring ephemerals in this area, but of course there's garlic mustard like many of us have dealt with before. So I spend, let's see, I spend a lot of my time pulling garlic mustard. So this is just a before and after shot of this little area I was working in, pulling all the garlic mustard rosettes out. And of course, we get handfuls of beautifully healthy looking garlic mustard. So that's where this project has kind of started and led me. So eventually, this is about two years ago, I started seeing some garlic mustard that looked like this picture. And it doesn't look quite so healthy to me, which is amazing because usually garlic mustard, like many invasives, are, are beautifully vibrant and healthy looking. So I thought that was unique, but I only had seen it like once or twice on a few plants. So I wasn't really that interested in it. But then I started seeing it more and more. And when I looked at it, it would have sometimes these twisted seed pods you can kind of see here, which is, does not look healthy to me. It has these kind of puckered, crinkled looking leaves, which is unusual. So I started seeing this more and more. And so it made me kind of pay attention. So I started seeing plants like this and I'm like, oh, that's weird. They have like a mold slime on them. But then as I looked closer, oh, those that's not mold or slime. These are little aphids, little bugs. But of course, like I mentioned before, I am not an entomologist. So of course, like any good biologist, I did some Googling. And the what that led me to is this uh, this website that I have the link here, but it, it gave me an idea. I just kind of Googled aphid on garlic mustard plant. And this is what it came up with on the right. I'm like, okay, that looks kind of like what I'm looking at. Um, so I took some terrible pictures with my cell phone. So that's what these pictures are on the left. Um, and I sent I sent them out to I sent the pictures to a woman who I'll mention in a minute. A minute. Her name is Doris, and I was like, "Hey, do you know what these are? I think it could be garlic mustard aphid." And she's like, "She didn't say it like this, but she's like, those pictures are terrible. Send me some samples so I can actually uh, see what you're looking at." So I sent out some pictures to Dor or some samples to Doris, and she was able to confirm that this is the garlic mustard aphid or grenade aphid is another name for it. So Lycaphis alariae. Um, and she did a little bit of work on it and published a manuscript on the genetic work and also the morphology work and measurements that she worked on to, to prove that this is the garlic mustard aphid. 
And the interesting thing is she said this was the first record in the United States. So it's originally from Europe where garlic mustard is from. And so that was really interesting is that it had never been recorded in the US before. And they also, another interesting thing you can see in this top, um, top right picture, that's a little egg of garlic must of the garlic mustard aphid. So I was able to send her that egg and she did genetic work on that egg to make sure that that's the garlic mustard aphid. So kind of what's telling us it's here and it's overwintering here. So it's probably here to stay, here to stay. I've also been able to find this every, every year on, in varying population levels from, from the first time we saw it up until this year. So I've seen it every year. So Doris was able to confirm that for us. So that's the aphid. So now I want to get into a little bit more about how to identify the plant and how to identify the aphid. So this, as many of you probably know and have seen and know and love, this is garlic mustard um, plant. So the nice thing, hopefully, about this aphid is that this is a garlic mustard specialist as opposed to being a generalist. So a specialist lives its whole life cycle on garlic mustard plant. So they overwinter their eggs on garlic mustard rosettes. And then they, as the rosettes become adults, they feed on the garlic mustard plant and they stay on that plant for their whole life. So that's interesting news to, to, to us because if it's a specialist, it should only be eating garlic mustard, which is good news to a lot of people who, who work with garlic mustard. But just to show a little bit more of what the plant looks like, if you're not familiar, so it has these, it's in the, the, the mustard family, of course. Um, it is edible. Some people think it will use it for pesto. Um, usually you use the younger leaves, the first year plants. They are said to taste like garlic and mustard, hence garlic mustard plant. Um, it was brought over as a culinary plant. And you can see it has these four little white petals on the flower. Um, it has kind of a triangular shaped leaf as it's an adult. It has a this kind of wavy serrated edge. And then as it goes throughout the season, it the flowers will grow into these seed pods or salix. And then those seeds are inside of those seed pods, kind of like peas in a pod. So garlic mustard, uh, the reason a lot of land managers are concerned with it, it's alleopathic. So the roots can put chemicals into the soil that encourage other garlic mustard plants, but discourage our native plants. You can see in this left picture, like this is a whole hillside of garlic mustard. So it just takes over. So it kind of crowds out our native plants, especially our spring ephemerals, which already have such a short window to flower and, and reproduce. Um, it has a two-year life cycle as well. So in that first year, first year, it'll be a basil rosette. And then in that second year, it will bolt and become the adult plant and seed. Um, I've heard a lot of varying numbers, but each plant can produce, I've heard anywhere from like a hundred to a thousand seeds that go into that soil. And then those seeds, once they're in the soil, can le live in the seed bank for up to 10 years. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of background on garlic mustard and why many people kind of consider it a, an enemy to their land management. So now moving on to the plants that I started seeing, which is uh, interesting to me. So I started seeing these plants in these pictures that are kind of, they just don't look quite healthy. They have this puckered or wilted look. They just don't look as bright green and vibrant. Um, these twisted seed pods is really unique, unhealthy looking to me. So this is something that in my years of garlic mustard management, I hadn't really seen before unhealthy looking plants, but it seems like myself and other people are seeing plants that look, look like this more and more often. So usually when I see a plant like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the aphid is going to be on it, but it's a good place to start looking. Um, so usually if I see a plant that looks like these, I will we'll look for the aphid on it just to see if it's there. Even healthy plants though, healthy looking plants can have the aphid as well. So now moving into how to identify the aphid itself. And this is important and I'll tell you why in a couple minutes. Like I said before, I was not an entomologist. So this is all stuff that I've learned as I went. Um, but this first slide is showing aphid anatomy. And I, there's a couple things here that I wanna point out. So aphids, in order to be considered an aphid, they of course have six legs, they're an insect, but the structures that I wanna point out that help you know that it's an aphid are these here. 
I've heard them called tailpipes on this di diagram. They're labeled as siphunculus. Um, if you are an aphid or a entomologist, also please feel free to correct me. Um, but so they have these little tailpipes and then they also have this cotta structure here. It's kind of like a, what I would refer to as almost like a little tail. So cotta, and you can see it in this view here. So knowing that cotta is very important as well in doing identification of this, of this species. They also in the adult phase can have be winged or have no wing, wingless. So now moving into the life cycle, this is not necessarily something you would need to know if you were trying to just look for the aphid, but this was really important to me as I was on my journey through this project. And I'll tell you the kind of funny, embarrassing story in a couple, couple slides, but just to show you what the life cycle is. So you have, like I mentioned, those eggs that overwinter and those eggs hatch into the first instar. And that first instar just looks like a little aphid. It's not like a caterpillar, for example, where there's a larva that goes into a cocoon and hatches. It's gives, it looks like it's adult, but just small. And then it goes through a couple instars and gets bigger and bigger. And then you have a wingless female and she gives live birth and you can have that cycle continue and continue and continue. And then what will happen is as the plant starts to get overcrowded and there's too many aphids on there, they can sense that. And then they will, they will give birth into a form that will become winged. So that winged form has both male and female. And the unwinged form is, is usually a wingless female. So that kind of gives you an idea. And then after that, so those adults that have wings will then fly to the next garlic mustard plant and then continue on and give birth to those females again. And then the cycle continues. So that's what the life cycle looks like. And then towards the end of the summer, they'll have that egg again and that egg will overwinter until the next year. <clears throat> so this is a lesson learned on why you should know your subject. So sometimes when I give this presentation, I talk a little bit about the citizen science aspect of this too, and knowing your subject and how to present that to people. So this was just kind of a, a lesson that I learned in knowing your subject. So you kind of have a little bit, bit of hints now that I've um, told you based on their life cycle, but I did not know this before I started this project and I wanted to create a little terrarium on my desk with aphids. That way, you know, I've had some professionals ask me to mail them samples. That way I had them right there ready to go. And also it's just really interesting to me because I'm a big nerd to be able to kind of watch your subject and see what the life cycle looks like. So like I mentioned, not an entomologist. I didn't know any better. Um, does anybody know what this is? these little larvas. You can put it in the chat if you, and we said looks like a tick or a flea, not a tick or a flea, good guess. Any other guesses on what these little larvas are? Fly larva, definitely getting clo closer, yeah. So <laughs> this is a larva of this midge here. So this is, I don't know the scientific name for it, but it's an aphid midge essentially. And the larva, right here, all these little orange and yellow guys, they eat aphids. So the larva will go up and basically suck the life out of these aphids, and then they become these guys. But like I said, I did not know this at first. So to me, I just assumed like, oh, it's an insect. It probably has an egg to a larva to an adult. So I kept finding these on plants and kept introducing them into my terrarium because I'm like, oh, great, I'm introducing more babies. I'm gonna increase my population. And of course that didn't work out. <laughs> so these are not aphids. These are a midge or fly family larva. Um, the other thing is uh, Doris, who I mentioned earlier, had asked me to send her some winged samples when I got them. So I'm like, okay, great. Once my terrarium gets too crowded, then the aphids will have wings and then I can send her those samples. So I started seeing these guys. I'm like, oh, great. I've got my winged aphid samples. No, <laughs> as like I said in the spoiler already, these are those aphid mage adults, and you can tell by these little structures here, they're called haltiers. So that is not a structure you'd find on an aphid. Like I mentioned in a few slides ago with the anatomy of an aphid, an aphid would have little tailpipes and a cauda. So just a good lesson learned of why you should know your subject and why it's important to really thoroughly research the things that you're that you're trying to work on. All right. 
All right, so now we know what an aphid anatomy looks like, what the life cycle is. Now, what does this specific aphid look like? So the aphid we are working with is the garlic mustard aphid or Lipaphis alariae. There is one other species that looks similar in that you can you can find on garlic mustard, and that's the turnip aphid or Lipaphis pseudobrassica. So they are in the same Lipaphis genus, and they look really similar, especially with the naked eye. So this slide, I'm going to go through how you can tell the difference between the two. So the first thing, like I mentioned, is the host species. If you're looking for the garlic mustard aphid, it is a specialist. So it should only be on garlic mustard. If you do find it on something other than garlic mustard, that would be really interesting to tell somebody um, because that, that would not be necessarily a good thing. But supposedly, it is a garlic mustard specialist. So the garlic mustard aphid will only be found on garlic mustard. The turnip aphid is a generalist on brassica species, so mustard species. So that's all kinds of species like in agriculture, like mustard or cabbage or turnips, of course, the turnip aphid. But then there's also other species that it could be found on, like dame's rocket or garlic mustard. So I have found the turnip aphid on garlic mustard. I've even occasionally found both species on the same plant. Um, so definitely knowing how to tell the difference can be important. And there are people like, like me who you can send photos to or upload onto the apps that we'll talk about in a little bit that will help you know the difference if you, if you can't tell yourself or if you don't have a microscope to look through. So host species is the first thing. If we're looking for the garlic mustard aphid, we're gonna be looking at garlic mustard plants. So the second thing is the color, and this is what has been really helpful to me, especially looking at photos. The garlic mustard aphid is kind of this dark gray teal color that you can see on the left here, whereas the turnip aphid on the right is kind of an olive green color. So even in a photo, it's usually somewhat easy for me to tell if, the, if it's the garlic mustard aphid or not. That being said, the color can change a little bit on these species, so that's not always of course, most of us know like color is not always the best way to identify, but it at least gives us a pretty good hint on as to which is which. The next thing and probably the most complicated thing to look at is the measurements, the kata, and then of course genetics. So most of us do not have access to genetics and most of us probably aren't going to be able to do those measurements under the microscope. But like I mentioned, and I can show you guys in a little bit, that paper that that Doris wrote, and that has the information on the measurements and the kata and the genetics if you wanna look at that. What we can look at usually, not as much with the naked eye, but if you at least have a magnifying glass or a microscope, you can look at the kata. So what the kata is, remember, is that little um, tail area. So that's here on the garlic mustard aphid and here on the turnip aphid. And I kind of did this visual to kind of show you in an exaggerated way the difference. So the kata on the garlic mustard aphid is like a wider triangular shape, whereas the kata on the turnip aphid is kind of skinnier and longer and more of like a spoon shape or like a rounded shape at the bottom. So that's what these photos here by Doris are showing. And then you can kind of see it in these um, specimens as well, that kind of a uh, short squat triangle shaped kata versus the long skinny um, spoon shaped kata. And I have a couple other photos of that that we'll, we'll see as well. So that's how you can identify this particular aphid. There are a few other species in the Lipaphis genus, but so far I have only seen these two on garlic mustard. Um, so those are the, the differences that you can tell between the two species. All right, so these are just some more photos. Like I mentioned, they do have a winged form and the winged form is a little bit more rare because like I said, they only produce that form once their area starts to get crowded, then they'll have some winged variants and those will fly off. So usually you're gonna see the adult, but the winged form, just so you can see it, it has the similar same color and the kata would still be the same. It still has those tailpipes. Um, so that's what that one looks like. The adult, like I said, it's also called the grenade aphid or the garlic mustard aphid. So it's kind of cool because this picture, you can kind of see why they call it a grenade aphid. So it has kind of these um, square pattern on its back usually. 
and it's small so it's about one to two millimeters so if you might you may need a magnifying glass or a microscope to look at it but even from a distance you can still see like in this photo on the bottom left you can still see the dark color especially against the light green of garlic mustard and just to point out too like different areas where i've seen the aphid like usually it depends on the time of year but but you'll see the garlic mustard aphid sometimes hiding between the buds of the flower. Sometimes it'll be along the stem, like in this bottom left picture. Usually when I see it, it's on the underside of leaves. So if you're trying to do a quick check for the aphid on garlic mustard plants, you'll have to tip the leaves up to look underneath. And then sometimes, especially really early in the season, they seem to be not on the roots, but at the very base of the stem. Those kind of some tips and tricks of where you might find the aphid. All right, so now I have a little game and let me open up my chat. So I'm going to have you guys try and, and figure out garlic mustard aphid or not. So is it the garlic mustard aphid? Yes or no? So here is our first picture. Garlic mustard aphid, yes or no? Yep. I see some yeses. Yep, this is the garlic mustard aphid. So we can tell it has that nice dark bluish gray color. There's even a little bit of damage on the leaves that you can see. So yep, that is the garlic mustard aphid. About this photo. Yes or no? Yeah, I see some no's. So this is not the garlic mustard aphid. This is the turnip aphid. So you can see it's that lighter green, olive, olive green color. Now these two pictures, it's fairly easy to tell, but it's not always so easy. So some of the pictures that I'll go through are easy, some are not. So I really wanna go through this exercise to help you guys understand as potential people who might send photos in through one of these apps of what is easy or what is not easy as someone who's a verifier of these records. All right, what about this one on the, the right? Yes or no? Garlic mustard aphid, yes or no? So I see a yes, I see a no. So I see another yes. All right, so this one is really tricky because it's further away. I think that this is not it. So to me, and I'm trying to look, you know, at the pictures that are more in the light or the areas of the picture that are more in the light. To me, this looks more like that light olive green color. So. You can see some of these are tricky and most of these, these are actual photos that I have received through the EdMaps app. Um, so it's not always easy to tell. So having a lot of pictures is really great. So most people, these are just one picture that they send in. Most people will send in multiple pictures. All right, what about this one on the left? Yes or no? Yes, yep. This one is a yes. So this one's a little bit easy to tell. You can see that dark gray color against the dark, the light colored leaf. So yes. All right, what about this picture? Yes, no, I don't know. I see lots of no's. So probably not, it's kind of hard to tell, but this just kind of gives an idea of what pictures may or may not be useful to a, ver a verifier. Someone said, erg, <laughs> yeah. So. I don't know, I'm gonna say no because I'm not sure. So I'm gonna say no. What about this picture? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, so, I mean, I see garlic mustard here and there's definitely damage on the garlic mustard that I can see, but unless I can actually see a photo of the aphid, I can't verify that saying for sure that yes, there's an aphid there. So it's still cool to see for me, like I still enjoy seeing pictures of damaged plants and we, we still encourage people to report damaged plants, but we just say that it's negative for the aphid, but just note that it has damage, but, but probably not. All right, what about this one on the right? I see some nose. So this one, I'm not really sure, like this little, these little specks could be the aphid, but it's really hard to tell. So I probably would not be able to verify this one. All right, what about this one on the left? Yeah, not enough bugs, someone said, yeah. All right, what about this one on the left? Yep, yes. Someone says yes, someone says no, someone says yes. So again, just kind of getting this point across that a combination, it could be a combination. 
but getting this point across like and also this is a pretty blurry picture so it's kind of hard to tell luckily this person also sent in this picture on the right so on this right picture it's a little bit easier to tell so yes or no on this now that you can see two pictures yeah so some people are saying yes. Yeah. So I would say this is probably our garlic mustard aphid. You can see like a good example here on the very right of this picture of a dark bluish gray color. And interestingly too, you can see that, that aphid midge here, that little orangey larva there. So these aphid midges I've actually seen quite often associated with this um, with this aphid, but that's a whole nother, another fun thing. All right, what about this? Yes or no, or maybe so. It's like a maybe, I would say, but we obviously can't see any aphids. So this is another one. Yeah, someone just put some question marks. So yes, it is garlic mustard plant, at least. There is damage, which is still interesting to see. But to me, I can't say that, yes, this is the aphid because we don't see the aphid in the photo. All right, what about this photo? These two photos go together. Any ideas? Yes or no? Aphid? All right. Yeah, so someone said flea beetle damage, good. So yeah, this is garlic mustard. When you think about aphids, aphids are not chewing holes in the leaf. Aphids are have sucking mouth parts. So they're sucking nutrients out of the leaf. So this here is something eating the leaf. And my guess would be flea beetle, someone said. So here's a picture of the little flea beetles that I've seen on garlic mustard. So I've seen this a lot too, which is still really interesting, but that's not the question that we're looking at when we're thinking about this aphid project. So you may also see flea beetles, but I do get a decent amount of pictures of damaged garlic with a lot of holes in it. And that's not aphid damage. That's probably beetle damage or something else eating the leaf. Yep. All right, got one last set of slides. So this is kind of looking more at that cotta. Do you think this is garlic mustard aphid? Yes or no? a no, I see a yes, I see a no. All right, so this one, see some more no's, good. So this one is not the garlic mustard aphid. So now we're looking at that cotta, it's kind of long and skinny and more spoon shaped. I know you can't necessarily see the end because my, my pointer was kind of holding it down, but to compare, we have this picture on the right. So you can see that wider, more triangular shaped um, cotta. So to note on these colors, it's pretty difficult to tell as well because these are preserved specimens. So aphids lose their color really quickly once they're preserved. So that's something to keep in mind is if you preserve it, you're gonna lose the color, but you'll be able to manipulate them more easily to see the cotta. So this is just another picture of that differences in the cotta. So that long skinny spoon shaped cotta versus that some people say like a tongue shape or a triangular shape, wider, shorter cotta. So that's our turnip aphid on the left and our garlic mustard aphid on the right. All right. All right, so now we have our aphid identified. We're, we're pretty decent on, on figuring out how to identify. Now what do we do? So at Holden, like I said, we have a research department, which is really amazing. So they can help me figure out some questions and how to answer these questions. So I can go to our research department and say, hey, I'm seeing an interesting observation. How do I test it to see if it's actually doing anything? So they um, are, this is in collaboration with Katie Stubel, who's our um, in our research department at Holden Forest and Gardens. So we came up with these two questions is first, quantify how the aphid is affecting growth and productivity of garlic mustard within Northeast Ohio. So this is important because is the aphid just making the plant look bad or is it actually having a, an effect on that? Is it a negative effect or is it a positive effect? So getting at those types of questions. And then the second question, which you all are potentially helping with or might want to help with is determining the local distribution of the aphid. And then of course, you, you all may have seen this, but that local distribution has kind of blown up a little bit and turned a little bit wider. And we'll talk about that when we get there. But that first question, quantifying how the aphid is affecting the growth and productivity of garlic mustard. So that's the first one we're gonna go through. 
So is the eighth and affecting garlic mustard? The way we went about this is, this is uh, research from last summer. We went through and we were able to collect samples with aphids and then of course control samples without aphids. And we would try and get them nearby each other and they would be in the same area. So samples with and without aphids. We are really lucky at Holden that we have a pretty decent crew of interns and volunteers. So on the left, that's our now core member, uh, Melissa, and she, and I and our other interns would go out and collect samples. And we would put them in a brown paper bag, you can see on the right. And when we were in the field, we would take measurements on how many stems there were, a score on the amount of aphids. So that score is a zero through a five. So a zero being none, um, and then a five being a thousand or more aphids. And then we would take a score on canopy damage of the plant. So that's again, was a score of zero to five a five being 100% of the canopy affected. So every single leaf has some damage on it. So we would then take those brown paper bags and then hand them off to our research department. And they had kind of an intake process for those plants. Would they, they would weigh the plants, they would take height on the plants, they would scan the leaves of the plants. So all that sort of data we were able to look at and we're still in the process of analyzing it and, and looking further into that data, but I at least wanna share with you all some of the stuff that we have found so far in that, that pilot project. And this is also worth keeping in mind, like this was the first year, this is only a pilot project of, for this, but I think it's some good first steps for figuring out what this aphid is doing. So the first one, the first measurement we, were, we looked at is specific leaf area and leaf biomass. So specific leaf, area is you take the leaf and you scan it on a scan, just a regular scanner. So we would put our leaves down, put a piece of glass on top to kind of keep the leaves down and then scan it. We would then use the software called ImageJ and we would scan it to this black and white picture. And then we would get essentially like a count of pixels. Um, I don't think it's actually pixels, but a count of how it allows us to compare the, how big these leaves are. And the idea behind this was, you know, I mentioned a lot of the leaves kind of look crinkled. So, you know, is the ape, our plants with the aphid on it have smaller leaves? And this we found out on the left, you can see the, the specific leaf area. So there was no significant difference there. So um, plants with and without the aphid were around the same for the the um, surface area of the leaf. And then on the right here, you can see though, there e even though there's a lot of variation, you can see with these error bars, there's no significant difference in the weight of the leaves specifically, but that's okay. So, I mean, we're seeing there's may not be differences in the leaves, at least that we're detecting uh, with this information. But then we also looked at height. So this is statistically significant. So the, the plants with aphids are significantly shorter than plants without aphids. So that's kind of interesting. And then we also weighed the total plant. So this doesn't include the roots. So we cut the plants off at the root, but the total biomass of the plant was much less in aphids with garlic mustard present versus plants without the aphid. So, so far they're shorter and they weigh less, which is interesting. Then we also looked at the number of seed pods, because if there's less seed pods, that means we're then affecting reproduction. And again, plants with the aphid present had statistically less seed pods than the plants with without aphids. So that's interesting. That means we're probably affect, the aphids are probably affecting this somehow in a negative way, it would seem. And then we also looked at, at, looked at twisted seed pods. So you can see in this picture on the right uh, that I'm holding this twisted seed pod. And sometimes these seed pods too, they'll be like thicker and shorter, but we just counted the number of twisted seed pods on plants. In this, you can see a big difference. So plants with the aphids present usually had a twisted seed pod or a few twisted seed pods. And plants without aphids did occasionally have a twisted seed pod, but much less. So our conclusion with all of that is the presence of garlic mustard aphid does seem to have an effect on garlic mustard. It's not yet clear if the aphid negatively affects the health and reproduction of the plant. I mean, based on the data, it seems like it does, but we do wanna do some further studies to really confirm this. But so far, it seems like this is good news. 
So kind of the idea of what's next and what we're working on so far this summer. So we're hoping to study the plant in unmanaged units. So right now, a lot of the units that we're looking at are managed units because those are the ones that I go to frequently because we're pulling out garlic mustard. So hope we're wanting to look at some unmanaged units and set up plots to look at what happens in those plots over time. We also wanna do more detailed mapping of the aphids on our property specifically. Um, so we wanna set up some meter plots and kind of get a better idea of how common this aphid is. And then we do wanna also count the amount of seeds. So we still have all of those seed pods collected from the last time we did this or from last summer. And I think they have actually, our, our research crew has started to count the number of seeds. And I'm pretty sure that I don't have the stats on this, but there are less seeds in those seed pods on average, which is good news as well. And then we also really wanna do a seed viability study as well, You know, just because those seeds may not look as healthy, but do they still create a plant? Cause that's what really matters is, are we actually making the population decline? So that's our next step as well as seed viability studies. So we're working on this summer, we're just gonna plant some seeds in a controlled environment and see, do they, do they germinate um, based on plants with aphids and without aphids. The other next step that we're kind of thinking about, so we've talked to many other professionals on this project and some of them have mentioned that it looks like this may not be a may not be damaged directly from the aphid, but it could potentially be a virus that the aphid is spreading. So again, I'm not a virologist, but if any of you are or know someone, please feel free to let me know. Um, I think probably what we'd like to do is just send in a couple samples and say, does this have a virus? And if it does, what is the virus? But that's kind of a next thing we want to look into. Maybe it's not a virus at all, but I think that's a, a worthy uh, pursuit. All right, so now we're getting more into the distribution. So this is the citizen science effort using EdMaps and other citizen science apps. And this is where you all come in. And this has been really amazing and fun for me to see because so many people from all over have been reporting this aphid, which is really cool. It's like, I'm a big nerd. So it's almost like Christmas, like, oh, I got another aphid picture in my inbox. So um, it's really cool to see how far citizen science can go and how, how many people have been interested in the project. So we specifically have been using EdMaps and there are also other citizen science apps that feed up into EdMaps. So many of you on this call may be familiar with iNaturalist or Gleden, the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. So iNaturalist and, excuse me, Gleden both feed up into EdMaps eventually. So iNaturalist is a little bit trickier because what needs to happen on iNaturalist is three or more other people have to agree with your identification and then it will feed up into EdMaps. With Gleden, that I think as soon as the verifiers on Gleden confirm it, then it automatically feeds up into EdMaps as well. So any of these apps, whatever your favorite one is, will work. I'll talk mostly about EdMaps today just because that's what I've been using most often, but you can use any of these for for helping report this aphid. And there are probably other ones as well, depending on which state you're in. A lot of the invasive species apps or bugwood apps all feed up into EdMaps. <clears throat> so yeah, just showing more pictures of the aphids here. All right, so we have this flyer on EdMaps and I'm actually going to pull this flyer up so you can see it a little bit easier. So here is what the flyer looks like up close. And this is a great resource. And this is like Kathy mentioned, this I think was already sent out with the webinar, but it'll also be in those links near where the, um, on the website. So this flyer walks you through how to report the aphid if you find it. It also has some pictures as well, a little bit of background information. You can also scan, you can even do it right now if you really want, but if you need help finding the EdMaps app on your phone, you can scan these QR codes or you can just look it up in your app store. EdMaps has a website version and a phone version, so I'll walk you through both, but this flyer mostly walks you through the phone application of EdMaps. And the phone application of EdMaps is really similar to Gleden. So most of the stuff you'll see on this flyer would also apply to Gleden. I do also have my con my contact information on here. Um, you can see my email and my address. 
So on here, it says, if possible, also send us a sample. You don't necessarily have to send us a sample. The idea with that is eventually I would like to try to get a sample from each state. And those samples will then be um, put into a slide and preserved and then eventually put into the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. So I don't need tons of samples, but a few samples here and there from different states would be would be helpful for me. And then also, if you're not sure of your identification, then you can also send those to me and I can help you identify them as well. But so my address is there as well. If you do want to send a sample, email me first and I can walk you through how to send it. Um, so aphids are best, pre best preserved in ethanol, but you cannot send ethanol through the mail because it's flammable. Um, so the, the tip that I was given was to send it in white vinegar in a um, waterproof container a, or watertight container, and then white vinegar can go through the mail, whereas ethanol cannot. So anyways, just shoot me an email if you want to send a sample and we can talk through that. Now on the back of this flyer, we have a kind of a decision tree on that you can bring out with you in the field if you, if you want to on how to report your aphid finding. So the first thing is, do you see a garlic mustard plant? No, well then we don't need a report. But if you do see a garlic mustard plant, then yes. All right, our next question. Do you see the garlic mustard aphid? Yes. Well, let's so if you do see the aphid, then you're going to go on your phone app and you're gonna hit new sighting. And then you're gonna add or edit the species and you can type in garlic mustard aphid. So there is also garlic mustard on there. So if you want that report to get to the aphid phase, make sure you click on garlic mustard aphid, not just garlic mustard. And then take plenty of pictures. The nice thing is you can take your pictures if you're using your phone and upload it later to the app. So you don't have to necessarily be using your data as you're out in the field looking. But so take lots of pictures. So walking you all through that, that exercise of what the pictures are helpful. And Kathy mentioned to me before you all got on, like something that she says is take a picture that you think you would need to identify something that you're looking at. So thinking about, can you see the plant? Can you see the insect? Take some photos up close of the insect. Take some photos from far away of the damage. So I think you can add up to four photos on, on the website application. I think it might be unlimited on the phone application, but either way, make sure to take a few decent pictures. All right, and then of course you want to say it's positive. You're reporting a positive occurrence of the garlic mustard aphid. So great, if you see it, see the garlic mustard plant, see the aphid, go ahead and report it. Also, if you were to see it on something that's not garlic mustard, that would also definitely be worth reporting. And then you also, there's a comments section, writing that in the comments would be really good as well. All right, so now let's go back. Let's say we see our garlic mustard plant. We do not see the aphid. So now we're gonna go to no. Okay, do we see damage on the plant? Like I mentioned before, that is also still really interesting to me. So you can do yes, but you're still going, instead of saying it's a positive report, you're gonna say it's a negative, but then in the notes say that you see damage. And again, the damage we're looking for is more of this wilted look or the twisted seed pods, not necessarily holes in the leaf. So the holes in the leaf are probably from something else. Or maybe you don't see damage and you don't see the aphid. That's still really interesting because it's really important for the distribution of this to know where the aphid is, but also to know where it isn't. So reporting negative sightings, it may not seem as exciting, but it's still really valuable to science to know that the aphid is not there. So you can also report a negative sighting. And the way we do that, you still are gonna go to new sighting, but you're just gonna put negative instead of positive. And what would also be helpful is still uploading a picture of garlic mustard, just the plant, because that's important to know too, is there garlic mustard there? So even if you don't see the aphid, you can still take a picture of the plant and report that as a negative sighting. So that's how you do the phone application. And like, like I said, this flyer will be one of the resources uh, that you have. And just move this bar out of the way. All right. So now I wanna walk you through the EdMaps website and let me pull it up. 
So the EDMAPS website is also just as valuable. Both of those reports go to the same place. And this is what it will look like when you pull it up. This is the, the home page. There's all kinds of cool stuff on this website. I'll walk you through a couple of them. But the most important thing I want to walk you through is how to report a sighting. So this website makes it pretty easy. So you're going to go to report a sighting. Something I should mention too is whether it's on the phone or the website, you do have to have an account. So we're going to go, I'm logged into my account. So report sightings. Now we're thinking about the aphid. So the aphid is an insect. So we're going to click insect. And then you're going to look at for your state or whatever state you're in. So I'm in Ohio. Now, as you're looking at this form, it can be a little bit overwhelming, but some things to point out, the only fields you need to fill in are the ones that are red. So some of this other information could be helpful to have, but you have to remember too, this website is not just used for this project. This website is used for multiple different reports of invasive species. So that's why a lot of this can be helpful for other things, but it doesn't necessarily matter as much for the project we're working on. All right, so we're gonna report our positive or negative. So again, if you find a garlic mustard plant with no aphids, you do negative, but we're gonna do a positive one. So now we're looking for the pest. So we're gonna type in garlic mustard aphid, or you can also do the scientific name, Lipaphis. And then host species, you don't have to do it. I don't even think garlic mustard is an option on here. So you don't have to worry about that. The observation date, the date you saw it, Habitat, you also don't have to do, you can do this if you want, but this does not matter as much to us. Same with life stages, that doesn't necessarily matter as much. The sex doesn't matter. And also it'd be really hard to tell. Um, all of this information, you don't really necessarily need to fill out unless you want to. So the infested area is, is it acres? Is it, how much is it? So we're gonna go down to location. Now location is really important because that's what's gonna give us an idea of where this is. Even if you don't know your latitude and longitude, that's okay. You can do your state, you can do your county. So I'll say Lake County, that's where I'm, uh, where Holden is. And then the nice thing, you can just leave it at that at the county level, which is still good. But if you want it to be a little bit more specific, you can add a marker here. So you can zoom in to the area where you are. So let's just say, um, maybe I'm at Wildwood Cultural Center. So I'm gonna zoom in there and you can place your marker, you know, wherever, approximately wherever you saw it. So now you have your marker placed, if you wanna do a description, especially if you're just placing a marker, you could say near County Road A or something like that, but we don't necessarily need to have that. Now here's where it's really important as well as the images. So it looks like you can do four images on the website. So you can just choose wherever your image is and add that. And then you can caption it if you would like, you don't necessarily have to, but maybe we say garlic mustard aphids on stem. You can put your name in there if you want to for who the photo is by. It looks like you can do five images. And then additional information is really helpful as well. So this is where you can put your comments of this aphid was not found on garlic mustard or I see lots of damage, but I did not see aphids. So those comments can actually really come in handy. A voucher specimen made, Mostly it's gonna be no for us. Luckily, usually photos are enough to identify this plant. And then you'll just submit your report. So I won't do this one because it's not really a real one. But after you submit your report, what happens is it goes to EDMAPS verifiers. So I, for example, am one of the verifiers. So what will happen is as soon as you submit a report, it will come to my inbox in my email. And then I will go through and say, yes, this is the aphid or no, this is maybe the turnip aphid that we're not necessarily looking for. So it'll come to my email and then it'll be submitted. And once it's submitted, you'll be able to see your, your report on the distribution map. So that's the next thing I wanna point out on the EDMAPS website. So you can't see this on the app, but you can see it on the website. So sometimes it's kind of fun just to go and look at the distribution maps. So again, we're looking for an insect. 
And let's look at our garlic mustard aphid. And here is our map that we can see. And you can zoom in and out. So you can zoom closer to your area. And there's a couple different ways you can look at that. So at this, so you can choose these different options up here. So here, the reds are the positive and the blues are the negative, which is really cool to see both observations. You can look at it by state. Let me zoom in a little bit. So you can see all the states where people have um, identified this aphid. You can also look at it by county level, which is also really interesting to me. Zoom in here. So this is like fun for me to look at because I'm from Ohio and we had the first observation of it, but most of our counties don't have observations yet, which is kind of interesting. So that's um, part of the reason I am hoping to do a little bit more webinars this year for, for you all and, and other folks as well of trying to get more reports in Ohio. Um, you can also look at points and lists and, and all different other types of ways. Hey, it's counting points. You want to see the list. This is probably more helpful if you're looking for your specific one. If it's been updated or not, you can see yours here, or you can also zoom in on the map. Um, let's just go back to real quick. Just to see you. And I believe you also get an email as well once your report is verified. So yeah, you can look at the county and then you can zoom in and see all of the points. And you can also see the record ID and all that kind of stuff. So this one was one that I reported, but that's how you can tell if your report is up there. And I will say too, like, I have lots of other things in my day-to-day -day job, but I do try to get to reports like once a week or so. So it may not be instantly um, verified, but it will be within a week or at the most two weeks. All right, so let me go back to here. So that's our EdMaps website. And play our PowerPoint. There we go. That's just a picture of a flyer. Move this far out of the way. All right, we do also have this, which I'll I can send to Kathy and Marnie to upload onto. So this is a um, aphid ID card. So this is a wallet size card that you can put on in your wallet if you really want. But it just kind of has some additional information on where to look, how to identify it, and then how to report it. It also has this cute little millimeter tape on it that you can use to, to measure your aphid. There are actually some decent sized aphids out there. This one is a small one. Um, so one, one to two millimeters. So that kind of gives you an idea. You can, you can even use this to take a picture next to the aphid if you want. Something else to consider as you're taking pictures too is like what the background looks like. So I find that holding up something white or black behind the plant can help your camera focus a little bit better. All right, we looked at EdMaps. And this is just kind of a fun thing. I like to show kind of a last year compared to this year. So we've already had a lot more reports um, come in from this year. So this right now is showing 2022 reports. And then here we have our 2023 reports. So it's really fun and cool for me to see how many more reports are coming in. And just looking at it in a different way. So this is the county level data. So you can see the, the southernmost point we had last year was in uh, nor about Northern Ohio. And you can see this year, now we're all the way down to Kentucky is kind of interesting. So my hunch is that this is probably, this aphid is probably almost anywhere we can find garlic mustard, but of course we need reports to verify that. I also should mention too, an interesting thing is once we started doing this project, um, a lot of people kind of said like, oh, I have seen this before. So I think it's been here way before 2019 when we reported it, just people hadn't reported it before. So I think it's been around for a while. I don't think it was necessarily introduced through Holden. I mean, it looks like it's all over at least the Great Lakes region now. And then just a, a state view from this year of all the states that are kind of being colored in. So I would love to be able to eventually see, you know, an overlay, and this is something that I'm working on as well, an overlay of 
where garlic mustard is versus where the garlic mustard aphid is being found. Um, this is just a list of the states where we've, where the aphid has been reported. So it's been really interesting to see um, all of this uh, information come in. It's almost heartwarming kind of to me to be able to see all of the, the support and interested people looking at, at uh, identifying this aphid. So I do want to just show you a couple more resources on here and then I'll do some frequently asked questions and then get questions from you all. So, um, let's see, let's see. Oh, just to show you too, what it looks like when it comes in to me. So here's one from Dave Apsley, some photos. So this is what it looks like from the verifiers end when we're verifying records. So it'll tell me the ID, the species, and then it'll show me the images and I can zoom in on these images as well. So you can see, and then I'll just go through and verify if this is so to me, this definitely looks like the garlic mustard aphid. So I would go through and say review and release. It's identified credibility, it's credible or it's even verified. So I would say this definitely looks like it. So it's verified. And then I can put comments on here as well. So usually when I put comments, it's something, if it's not the garlic mustard aphid, I'll try and describe why but that's the information you'll get. I can also make the record negative if this wasn't the garlic mustard aphid, or if I'm not sure if it's the garlic mustard aphid, then it becomes a negative record. So that's just to show you what it looks like from the back end from our view. So you can see like pictures are really helpful. Even using your hand in the background can be helpful because it gives it an even lighter background. It helps your camera focus a little bit more. And it's kind of nice to have a picture of the whole plant as well. And you can kind of see the damage on it, which is interesting. Here's a picture of the twisted seed pods. So all of those things come in handy and are interesting for us to look at. I did also wanna point out the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. So that one, that's one that's frequently used in Ohio. So you can download the app for that for iPhone and Android. And the process for that is pretty similar to the, the EdMaps process. This I just wanted to point out, this is the paper by Doris. So if you are an entomologist or do you like doing measurements under microscopes, this has a lot of that information on the morphological data. So here's the measurements that she did. And just to zoom in a little bit. So here again, you can see those differences in the kata and she compares the, the garlic mustard aphid on the left here to the turnip aphid on the right. And so she has some pictures in here as well. Some of the other measurements. And then she also, if you are a genetics nerd, I don't really know what this means, but maybe you do. So this is here as well. So you can see the genetic work that she did on this aphid and the DNA barcoding she did. So I just wanted to point that out. Here's the flyer, of course. And then I do have, um, I'll put this on the resources as well. This is a printout, so a front and back of that AFID ID card. So if you print this uh, to actual size, front and back, then these should line up perfectly to get you that business card sized um, uh, business card, if you would like to have that. So I think it'll print out 10 of them. What is this, two? four, six, eight, ten. Just wanted to point those out. All right, now we'll go back to our presentation. Just about wrapped up. All right, so I wanted to go through some of the really common frequently asked questions I get, and then we'll dive into your, your all questions. So first question I often get is, if I find the aphid, should I stop pulling garlic mustard? And this is a really tricky one because I often am in what I would consider management units where we're pulling garlic mustard and I find the aphid. So the good thing is it does seem like the aphid is negatively impacting garlic mustard. However, I don't know if I would at this point say stop managing your garlic mustard because is it, to me, the areas that we manage at least are holding are our highest priority areas. They're our most diverse. They're the areas we really don't want garlic mustard. So for me, it's not worth the risk necessarily to leave the, the plants. 
if you only were managing maybe your backyard or a small area, then I would say maybe you could stop pulling it, but with the caveat that you should probably clip off all the seeds, which would also be a lot of work. So it is a little bit tricky because, and there's not really, this is a very gray area, I guess I would say. Um, you don't want to, you know, I feel kind of bad sometimes because I'm just pulling plants with the aphid on it and we compost them where we are um, in just kind of a, a pit or we, or we throw it in trash bags and throw it away. So it kind of stinks because you feel like you're throwing away something that's negatively impacting garlic mustard, but it's not necessarily worth the risk at this point without all the, like I said, we're still only in the second year of research. So it's really up to you and what you wanna, what your land is and what your decisions are. But that's what I would say to that question. And if you all have different opinions, I'd be happy to hear them as well. But that would be my inclination. For us, what is nice is Holden is so big. And like I said, there's 3000 acres with only three people. So we just have a bunch of management units that we do not get to. So I am hoping that in those unmanaged units will kind of sustain our population of aphids. Um, but we'll just have to see as time goes on. So that's one of the first questions I often get. Next one is, do you want a sample and what will you do with it? And I already kind of went over this, but the shorter, the short answer is um, maybe, or it depends. So if it's a new state record, I would be excited to have a sample. That way I can kind of add it to my collection that will eventually go to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, kind of a proof of concept if anybody ever wants to, to really look into it or do more genetic work, then we have that those samples from different different regions and different states. Um, so two things will happen with it. I will preserve them in ethanol for some of them. And then I'm hoping to take one or two from each uh, area and make it into a slide that people can look at under the microscope as well that, can, that clearly uh, defines and shows that cotta. Another one I get is, is this the critter you're looking for? So I get a decent amount of emails of pictures. Some of them are great, some of them not so great. Um, so that's another one. Just really think about what pictures you're taking and if that will be helpful or not. Um, yeah, I can't emphasize enough having a good picture because that's really what we're using to identify, identify this. Should I be worried about my native mustard species? This is one I get often as well. And this is another kind of gray area of we don't really know yet. Um, I would, at this point, it seems like no, for the garlic mustard aphid, you shouldn't necessarily be worried about your native mustard species or agricultural mustard species because this is a specialist. However, the caveat is the turnip aphid also is, found on garlic mustard, but can also be found on native mustard species. So I have gotten a few emails from folks asking, you're saying, you know, I found this aphid on a endangered mustard species. Then I would probably, you might want to worry about that. So it's kind of up to you. I still think it's probably worth checking if you have some native mustard species that are endangered or that you really care about, it's probably worth a check, but you're probably not gonna find the garlic mustard aphid on them. You may find other aphid species, but as of right now, this is considered a specialist. And I do believe um, Doris, who's the aphid identifier, I believe she might do a little bit more research on the, if this is a specialist or not. So far it seems like it is, but that's always something that people think about when they think about biocontrols is, you know, once it eats all the garlic mustard, is it gonna switch to a new species and, and things like that. So the short answer is, <laughs> I don't think so, but I don't wanna confidently say that. Um, I think that's all the frequently asked questions that I get. So at this time, if you have questions, try and put them in the Q and A. I do wanna take a second as you're writing up any questions to thank you all for being here and thank you for your time and your help. And um, if you do, whether you do end up reporting on the apps or not, I still think it's worth it to get the word out and just be more informed. Um, and thanks uh, Kathy and Marnie for having me on. I do also wanna just quickly thank some of our, our collaborators. So this has been a really great collaborative effort. We've had a lot of help from other organizations, even ones that aren't listed on here, but 
MIPIN, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, they have done a lot of work on advertising this. So if you don't follow them on Facebook and you have a Facebook, they're a good one to follow, not just for this project, for other invasive projects as well. They helped us create the flyer and have done an excellent job pushing out um, social media um, and picking a lot of uh, local newspapers have picked this up through them. So that's been fun. EdMaps has been a really big collaborator. So of course, they're the ones who put this on EdMaps for us and working with them to get this on there. And then we did also recently receive a grant from the Ohio Division of Natural Areas and Preserves to be able to travel a little bit and do more workshops like this in person. They also funded me buying a microscope, which has been super helpful. I love it. Um, a lot of the pictures you saw in this presentation today are me like taking my cell phone and putting it up to a microscope and trying to take a picture, which works okay, but the new microscope I was able to get has a camera attached to it. So I'm really excited to, to play with that a little bit more. So again, thanks for your time and help. And I guess I'll stop sharing. Um, my contact information is on that flyer and will be in the emails as well, but that's everything I have. Thank you, Rebecca. Nice job, Rebecca. Yeah, really good presentation. And uh, I will reiterate, and I think Marnie will too, that the idea that when you're taking photos to report, put yourself in our shoes because <laughs> these things come in and we open up the photos and we're kind of like, uh, and I'll be honest <laughs> that if I can't make out what it is, um, I will send you the message that says need more images because I really want to make certain that what we approve, and that's not saying that we won't make mistakes because we have, sure. um, but I, I want to make certain that we're doing the best job we can to verify. So put yourself in our shoes and there's 20 reports that come in from somebody today and <laughs> I want to see good photos. So practice your photography skills. <laughs> <laughs> but um and i know the aphids are small they're hard to take pictures of that's uh, true <laughs> and we so we realize there's you know some skill there that um not all of us and i'm bad with my phone so the thing is you could take photos um if you had a camera you could take photos as long as you could turn your gps on on the camera so the camera would still have your latin long attached to it and then upload it that way um, so there are ways, but yes, please think about us who have to look at that photo and say, sure, that's what that is. <laughs> I think that's what it is. I think that's what it is. Marnie had one come in for her that was looked like a little lizard and the picture was, it was a little video clip and he was running on top, across the top of the wall. And I was like, ah. <laughs> think that's what that was <laughs> but I mean and it ended up you could stop it and you could look at but it was just funny because it went past so fast it was like uh he did and I think he then uploaded another one with yes. an actual picture which was yes. very helpful <laughs> yes which is very helpful that's so, the one I was able to use yeah yeah so it it literally is just as as Becca says think about us that have to say yes that's what that is um but we love that you guys um follow up with these things and so yes. Um, we appreciate that because you guys are out there in way more places than any of us can be. Mm -hmm. But so let's see, we've got a few questions. So Janet says, I've seen plants with deformities similar to your pictures. Does one have to find the aphid to confirm that the deformities are caused by this aphid? Yeah, I would say yes, um, especially because I think I, I, meant, I mentioned in the presentation that the, there is a train of thought that this could be a virus rather than the aphid itself. And with viruses, we don't necessarily know yet what is carrying them. So I think it would be the aphid because most often we see the aphid associated with that damage. But, you know, it could be something else. It could maybe be those flea beetles. Maybe it's, I don't think it's the flea beetles, but it could be. So in order to confirm that it's the aphid, we do need to see pictures of the aphid. But it is still cool to see plants with the damage. And that's still worth noting because if we get some of those um, EDMAPS verifications saying that it is garlic mustard, but it's a negative sighting, what that says to me is that maybe it was the virus. And then eventually we could go back and look at where the virus is. So it's still worth reporting, even if you see that damage, but we can't just necess we can't necessarily 
confirm that the aphid did that damage. Great. Good question. Okay. So Max asks, what does four can mean on the paper bags? Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. So I also have terrible handwriting, so it probably didn't say, oh, four, <laughs> like the number four and can. Yeah. So can is can it be damaged? So a four is that scale from zero to five. So a four is, I think, I want to say it's like 60 to 80% canopy damage or something like that. I have to go back and look at the scale, but there's a scale that we use that lets us know the percentage of canopy damage. Then, then we use that for our statistics. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Laura asked, do aphids drop off plant the plant easily when it's pulled up? Oh, not really. A couple will shake off, but I've been so I like to collect them in the management units because I feel bad throwing them away. So I will collect them and try and add them to my little terrarium that I have going. So I will collect them, put them in a little box and have it in my backpack like all day. And they still do fine. And they'll still be on the plant at the end of the day. I've even put them in like loose pockets before on the plant and they stay on the plant. So they stay on the plant pretty well, at least this particular species of aphids. I don't know about others, but. Okay. Um, Laura also asks, I pulled garlic mustard this week in an area I've done before, but earlier in the season. The plants at the forest edge had reddish brown leaves. Is this just the end of the life cycle or related to the lack of rain or other? I'm not sure. My guess would be end of life cycle, depending on where you're at. Like where I know where I'm at in Northeast Ohio, like our plants are just starting to senesce and die back naturally. So my guess is just normal die back. So she also asked, where can you purchase multiple ID cards? But you had a sheet oh, yeah. there to print your own. Do you have them? I don't up? have them for purchase. I just honestly took that and I sent them to Staples and had them print business cards for me of that. And it was like, I want to say it was like 30 or 40 bucks for like a hundred of them. So you can yeah. print them yourself for pretty cheap or you can just um like I said I'll upload that or have Kathy upload that and you'll be able to print them yourself if you want. So we have um a series of plastic ID cards like that. So for spotted lanternfly yeah. and hibernum leaf beetle and all of those. So if we wanted to we could think about adding that to our mix and we could print some that folks could get access to. We can talk about that, Becca. I think that okay. as you were showing that, it was like, oh, now, of course, if we do it through Ohio State, there's things we have to follow, <laughs> but no. we won't talk about that. <laughs> but we can see if maybe we can add that to our <laughs> yeah. list of ticks and, you know, white nose. Many, many cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got lots of ID cards, so we could add that to the mix. Um, so Lynn asks, how do they spread? So they spread through, you know, if you think back on that life cycle, they go from, you know, they're, they're in stars and then when the plant gets crowded, then they have a winged form and that winged form then flies to the next plant. As far as spreading from like wherever they started to all of the different states, that I don't know. I mean, it's probably similar to other insects, like, you know, they go get onto things and spread around that way, but they do have that wing form that helps them spread locally. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Janet says, do we know if there are certain times of the year that the aphids are most likely to be found? Oh, good question. Yeah, definitely. So if you remember back to that life cycle over winter, they'll, they'll be in an egg form. So you probably won't see them. Um, I just happened to find that one egg one day and sent it to Doris to do the genetic work. But I would say I start seeing them in small amounts in like May, but I really don't see them kicking up because if you think, you know, they have to hatch from their egg and then start getting their population bigger and bigger. So I would say right around now is when I really start to see them. And I think I've had reports through EdMaps all the way to like August for them. So you can find them on rosettes as well. So even after the adult plants have senesced and died off, you can still find them on the rosettes because that's where they're going to put their eggs for overwintering. Oh. So I have seen them both. I feel like I tend to find them more on adults, but mm -hmm. obviously they need to go to the rosettes to overwinter. So great. Well, and the, the rosettes, the rosettes are the stage that I think most of us can walk right past, you know? Yeah. Everything, there's all sorts of green plants on the ground. And unless you're specifically keen in on garlic mustard, 
Yeah. It's just another green plant on the forest. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, so until it puts out the top and the flowers. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Easy to miss. For sure. Uh, okay. So Janet wants to know on a slightly different note. I wonder if any of you know whether OSU or another source has any video training available that promotes best practices for removing garlic mustard? These would be of interest both for lay volunteers and or for people who are coordinating or managing the removal of garlic mustard. So I think I have, I think I did a video during COVID about IDing garlic mustard, but I'll have to go back and see because I don't know that I talked about, you know, management or kind of I, maybe just briefly, but I can go back and look at that. Um, I think that was one of the invasive plants I did during You're either ready? that or I have one in process sitting in the queue <laughs> <laughs> to go back to and finish at some point. Um, yeah, I think MIFIN, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network has a document on like best management practices for garlic yeah. mustard as well, but I don't think they have any videos, Yeah. but I imagine there are also like other, like I'm sure like Ohio Invasive Plant Council might have some fact sheets i'm sure osu i'm sure you guys have some fact sheets at least we on garlic mustard yeah. yeah but in terms of like best management practices the only one i've seen recently is the one from mipin so if you just google mipin mipn or midwest invasive plant network google or garlic mustard then it should pop up but that's the yes. best i best guess have I fact have. Sheet, um posted on the woodland stewards website under the forestry tab and invasive species it'll talk about removal um, and it talks about chemical applications if you're going to go that route. Um, so probably I'd have to go back and look because it's been a while since I've looked at it. And um, but it will talk about mechanical, which would be pulling. And mm -hmm. I but a video, like I said, I'll have to go back and look and see if the yeah. spark videos that I was working on during COVID. I was thinking garlic mustard may have been the first one I did, but I'm not positive about that. <laughs> That honestly, you could even get on YouTube and right. Google it. I mean, granted, obviously take what you find with a grain of salt, make sure it's from a reputable, reliable, mm -hmm. you know, source, but yep. I bet YouTube would even have some videos. Marnie's posted the access to the fact sheet and then looks like, um, Mippin. That's, one. Yeah, that's your, that's your, um, info sheet that you've been sharing, Rebecca. And then I just okay. also added the AFID ID card as well. Nice. But like she's already mentioned, we'll make sure that we post all that stuff um, on our website as well. Yep. Um, so Naja says, do you know where the AFID is from originally? My apologies if I missed this during the program. Yeah, no worries. It's from the same area that garlic mustard is from originally. So Europe area, Europe and Asia. In Europe, it's not really much uh, as much as a nuisance, I don't think. Well, garlic mustard is not considered a nuisance there like it is here. So they don't really, I've tried to look into research for the garlic mustard aphid, but nobody has really um, like researched it because it's not an issue where, where it's from. So yeah, it's from Europe and Asia originally. Um, James says, do you want samples if it's from a new county in Ohio? If it's, uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, new counties would be good too. Okay. Means I have to go back out and find my garlic mustard I saw the other day. It was all <laughs> well, it's okay if you and... <laughs> can't find it, but samples of the aphid, I should say too. I don't want yeah. samples of the plant. You I can if you're... Yeah, yeah, I had one that was all crinkled, but I didn't see any aphids on it. So I just yeah. kind of, I had pulled it and I went. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, that goes. <laughs> I did have someone send me, I think there was a miscommunication and they sent me a plant piece. And I mean, it was so gross by the time I got it, <laughs> like you couldn't even yeah. see it. So yeah. think about how long it's going to be in the mail. And that's why we do preserved samples instead of live samples. Also, I don't think you could send live samples through the mail, <laughs> but preserved so samples are good. You need to, I mean, we used to send samples into the diagnostic lab and i think they still do take mailed samples but they're always cautionary don't put it in the mail on thursday and friday that it's going to sit over the weekend um, mm -hmm. try to you know mail it monday so that it gets there and yeah, uh, so you think about those things and usually there's recommendations on how to preserve the the plant like you know wet paper towel and foil yeah, and those nice kind of and yeah yeah to keep them so there are some methods, but um, so Christine asks, does the aphid prevent garlic mustard from producing seeds? 
Yeah, so at this point, it doesn't seem like it prevents it, but a lot of the seed work that we've done so far, which I didn't have the graphs on, but it does seem like the seeds are definitely deformed. So it still will produce seeds and not all of the seeds are deformed, but it does seem like a certain amount of the seeds are deformed at least. So I think my inclination is that it's going to cut back the reproduction of the plant, but it's not going to completely um, destroy the, the reproduction of the plant. We also don't know, or at least I don't know at this point of, you know, like, are those deformed seeds still viable? Are they still going to germinate and grow? Um, would that plant then still have damage as it grows? So mm -hmm. there's still a lot of unknowns at this point, but it does not completely eliminate the seeds from the plant. Okay. So there's a question on how do we get the flyer and they are posted in the chat right at the moment, but Marnie and I will make certain that um, when the video is posted, there will be links to hit um, to pick up that stuff um, in the description for the, the webinar on the Woodland Stewards website. Um, Cheryl wants to know what was the sample size for the biomass and seed pod study? Oh, uh, okay. I don't remember the exact number, but it was quite a few. Like I wanna say we had between a hundred or 150 plants that we were looking at. So half that being control, half that being with, with aphids. Okay. Um, Anonymous asks, is there research on how this aphid controls garlic mustard in Europe? There is not as far as I know. So I've reached out to the that original website I found from, it's called Influential Points, and it's like an aphid um, whole, whole website dedicated to aphids. I reached out to the guy on there and there's not really any, none that I have found. If you do find some though, <laughs> send it my way. Right. Um, Lisa wants to know, what are your thoughts on the 2021 study that suggests leaving garlic mustard and let it kill itself off? Yeah, so I'd be curious to hear you, Kathy and Marnie. From what I have read, I mean, I read that study and it seemed like the conditions that they were using are very different than the conditions in Ohio. So the conditions that, as far as I'm remembering, were like no deer, relatively low disturbance, whereas at least where I am in Ohio, like we have a lot of deer, we have a lot of disturbance, which are great conditions for garlic mustard. So my my gut instinct is that, yeah, it would maybe work if you had a really healthy forest and you didn't have deer and you didn't have disturbance, but we don't have that condition in, in at least where I'm at. So I don't know if Marnie or Kathy, if you have other things to say about that, but. Well, I think that, um, I mean, I end up with garlic mustard in my perennial beds and that's, you yeah. know, from the wildlife. <clears throat> I always mm -hmm. tease Marnie about that. It's her wildlife that creates a lot of these issues, but um, you know, they end up in the flower bed. And so, you know, they've come in, the seeds have come in on skunks and raccoons and all sorts of things. So we just have way too many mechanisms that move garlic mustard. Right. Um, and then, you know, on, on top of that, um, we, we have patches of garlic mustard where the woods is solid garlic mustard underneath mm -hmm. and you're not getting anything else. You're not getting other reproduction and garlic mustard has about a five year seed life, right? So you got a seed bed that's sitting there. So even if it died off, you still have a seed bed that can reproduce. Pop right back up. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, if you can eliminate it, I would mm -hmm. eliminate it. It's just. Yeah, I see this as a, just a like another potential tool in the toolbox, but it's right. definitely not a standalone right. option. It just mm -hmm. can't be, at least not from what we know now. <laughs> yeah. And I see Kathleen adding chipmunks and squirrels are moving them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, yes, it's all those, yes, yes. All those critters. <laughs> all the critters. <laughs> um, and then you go into Alan's question, which is I was kind of thinking about this. I figured this question would come up. I suspect that some folks will want to help out by spreading them to places where they would like to oh. see them. Bad idea? <laughs> I mean, probably a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, I think more research is needed before we were to use this as like a biocontrol. I mean, that is maybe the route that this would go, but like I and Holden does not have the capacity to do biocontrol research. So, I mean, that would have to be like passed off to the Department of Ag probably. Um, yeah, I would say it's probably not wise to spread it just in case. I mean, like 
for example, if, you know, this would be like way negative end of the spectrum of, you know, if this aphid were um, carrying a virus and if this aphid could then go to agricultural crops or something like that, then that could be bad. I see someone in the chat, Daniel mentioned that they're seeing turnip mosaic virus in their garlic mustard. So that's one of the ones that we've thought about as well, just getting it tested to confirm that. But he says the symptoms look different, but either way, um, yeah, I would never really recommend creating your own biocontrol in that way, um, unless there were a um, more, uh, more research and uh, going through official routes <laughs> to do that. Yeah. I, yeah, I, there's still stuff you don't know about it. So right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's always good to wait. Uh, and then Janet's is just wondering if others have noticed that this year is particularly bad for garlic mustard compared to prior years. Interesting. I've actually noticed at least in Holden that it's been a lighter year for us, lighter but year. I think it, I think it kind of varies probably based on where you are and where the garlic mustard is in its cycle. Yeah. yeah. I've noticed taller ones this year. I was in the woods with guys that were working in a soil pit and um, it, as I was looking around and I, I just, it was like, they seemed taller than normal. And I don't know, I don't know what created that, but it was just like, wow, those guys really have some height on them. Where usually, I that too. yeah, you don't see yeah. that. Um, so, you know. Sometimes I just ignore the garlic mustard because <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do kind of wonder, like, you know, the person who asked, like, will it self eliminate itself eventually? I mean, maybe because we are seeing things like this aphid. We are seeing things like the leaf beetle that's doing damage. So, I mean, like, there are things doing damage to the plant. And maybe, like, 100 years from now, it would be able to, you know, have a little, be in control a little bit. But, like I said before, that's just not a risk I want to take. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so we've made it through the questions. Um, and I, I'm looking and I don't necessarily see anything else popping up. Marnie, did I miss something? I don't think so. Helen says I'm mustard blind. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I was. <laughs> that's a willful blindness at times because I just don't want to see how much don't of it's in my woods. It. Yeah. The blinders on. <laughs> It's like the uh, burning bush that I'm starting to see in my woods. It's like, no, oh, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't want to yeah. see that. And so, but Becca, thank you. This has been really informative and I hope everybody enjoyed the session. Um, and we will, uh, as it's been recorded, it'll get posted. And while I'm doing this, let me put the link up for the SAF 